Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are fortunate enough to have uh, Martin Froling with us today. I hope I pronounced that close to correctly, English. who is an expert on MRI technology and a longtime user of Wolfram technology. Uh, I'm Noah Shartoff, and joined today, of course, as always, by John McNally. Hello, we are very happy to have you here. So uh, one of the questions that uh, I, of course, had is uh, if we could get a quick orientation uh, for the benefit of the audience and, of course, for us of, uh, you know, what what are the nuts and bolts of the fields that you are an expert in um, and sort of what what are the things that you use technology to do to help with all this uh, great medical technology that as people living today, we, we have access to. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for having me uh, on this uh, on this uh, nice uh, live stream. So I work with MRI scanners, basically very big magnets. Uh, we put people in, and then we make image of the human body. And an MRI system itself can generate a lot of different types of images. So you can do the anatomical images, but also more quantitative measurements. So depending on the settings of the scanner, and I specifically look at. Uh, muscles uh, in the context of neuromuscular disease and sports-related injury. So I had a quick slide to actually quickly introduce you to what I actually mean when I say quantitative um, uh, imaging. Mm -hmm. So um, the toolbox that I, I use in Mathematica and I develop is called QMRI tools and not MRI tools. So the Q stands for quantitative, and that's quite important. Did so, I hear you say that you developed this tool yourself? Yeah, from scratch. Very cool. Started during my master's in 2009, and since then I've been just keeping track of all the code I've written and been adding it to it. And uh, it's grown a, grown a little bit since then. Um, yeah, so you can you can sort of see an MRI scanner as a as a camera that takes pictures of the body. And, and if we talk about qualitative imaging, we just take a snapshot like you would with your camera, and we can see things on it, and that's quite interesting. But of course, um, we can also use the MRI as a quantitative precision measurement device. So it's more than that, that if you're looking at a night sky through a normal telescope or to something that actually measures wavelengths. So you can actually infer uh, a lot of quantitative measures from the, from the human body. And this depending on the settings and the filters we use, of course. So when we talk about quantitative imaging, a lot of things that are important to us are uh, precision, repeatability, um, what kind of measurement errors we can do. So there's a lot of like modeling going on beyond the image acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where I use Mathematica for. So basically, when I got the data from the MRI machine, we have to analyze it. We have to do, uh, derive quantitative values from it. And like I said, we're trying to look at muscle microstructure. So when muscles are healthy, they look like the left top image uh, over here. And then, of course, all kinds of diseases can happen where, where the cells change, the tissue changes. But, but with MRI, we're not at this length scale. So this is in the order of, of micrometers. And of course, with MRI, we have a resolution in the order of millimeters. So we're really looking at microscopic pictures of the human body, and we're trying to infer um, microstructural properties from that. And there we use modeling a lot. So of course, with modeling, you have equations and parameters typically derived from physics. So the entire MRI process is, a, is a really well described by physics. Mm -hmm. So we get our data and signal, and we can do the forward and inverse problems modeling. And of course, it's all based on assumptions and all the other things. And there we really want to look at, for example, muscle tissue. And when you get diseased, uh, fat will infiltrate the muscle. And then there's different techniques that I mostly use called um, Dixon-based imaging, where we can say something about the water and fat content of an of a imaging location. And something called T2, which is one of the main contrast mechanisms in, in uh, MR, where we can actually say something about inflammation. And something's called the fusion weighted imaging, where we can actually say something about the microscopic motion of water uh, within tissue. Oh so this is sort of the, the things how I use MRI and, and for this analysis of this modeling, uh, the, the, the Mathematica um, toolbox comes into play. So when you say microscopic motion of water, I, I assume that you're referring to more than more microscopic than water going through veins or or arteries that, that we're looking at it closer than that, like diffusion again uh, across cell walls or, or what are we talking about? Yes, there? yeah, so so our body is mostly water. Mm -hmm. And um, in MRI, uh, all, all um, atoms with a spin can actually be visible, mm -hmm. but water is the strongest one because we have it in abundance. Mm -hmm. 
So therefore, we mostly could water and water is in cells, outside cells, uh, within every tissue. So we're really looking at the uh, the water signal, and then if it moves in veins or in, in arteries, it flows. So we can actually measure motion with MRI. Um, if we call it, talk about diffusion, we're really looking at the microscopic motion. So that's indeed within cells, within membranes, the interaction with membranes. Um, we can also use at, at all kind, look at all kinds of other properties. So for example, the oxygenation in blood uh, gives uh, blood slightly different magnetic properties. And that's what, what typically is called uh, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you can look at brain activation, for example. Right, where, where yeah. oxygen is going into parts of the brain where it'll be useful. Yeah, so and if the, the oxygenation of the blood changes, the, the preparing the properties of the blood will change and that we can actually measure. So these kinds of properties, physics properties, underlie most of the MRI measurements we do. And um, so we typically don't really take one picture, but we take uh, an entire range of pictures and then we apply models to that. And that then um, MRI data, of course, you, when you take a picture of the body, um, the information you measure is actually um, placed in world coordinates. So we have like the body anatomically correct. So we can actually also infer something macroscopic from how is a muscle build up, how it's related. Um, so those, those are the things we do. Um, yeah, as for that, so to do the analysis, um, we get images from the scanner. Well, I mean, not really images, but data from the scanner. So mm -hmm. it's really, uh, MRI measures uh, radio frequencies, so RF waves, and that we convert via via transform to images or data sets. And those data sets uh, uh, we analyze using Mathematica. A brief question. So uh, out of curiosity, order of magnitude, um, how large is this data set that you would get from a typical MRI scan that someone would go in and uh, be a part of? Really depends. So when you typically look at anatomical imaging, it really depends on the resolution you, of course, take. For example, you take mm -hmm. a 20 by 20 centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, typical resolutions would be one by one by one millimeter. So we're also looking at a volume and not at a, a, a really cross-sectional photograph, but mm -hmm. we measure volumes. Mm -hmm. So then the data set would be, say, 128 by 128 by 128 voxels. Um, and that would be around 30 to 40 MB. But when we do quantitative measurements, it can go up to five, 600 MB per data set. Mm -hmm. And if we really take the raw data into account, it can be gigabytes. Um, so that, that that amount of data can vary quite a lot. Uh, it also depends what kind of models we're using. Some models need a lot of data. Some models only need a few uh, data samples. So it really depends on that. OK, interesting. And so uh, you, you have also, you mentioned that you've uh, written tools for dealing with this data and turning this data into analysis. So it looks like yeah. you have a, a demonstration here. So uh, I'm very yeah. much looking forward to, to seeing this because this is the first time that I have seen this. And, so, and uh, we should mention at this point, as is often the case in these live streams, that if we go through any of this code too quickly for you to follow, just know that the notebooks that we use in this demonstration are going to be included via link in the video's description shortly after we're done yeah. broadcasting so if there's anything you wanted to see in more detail code wise you will get a chance so you can see my screen clearly right oh yes mm -hmm. yeah so um this notebook is actually uh part of my, my my demonstration for the toolbox so the toolbox is aimed for expert users in the field so mm -hmm. um, my code typically doesn't really take care much about um uh, error catching or stuff like that so i assume that that the people are using it know what they're doing mm -hmm. um so it's called qmri tool so here um just to show people what actually is, uh, we are doing um i have this uh demo data extraction function that actually will um, extract in the location where you uh, installed the packlet in the resources, it will extract uh, a folder with demo data. And this demo data I will use in the toolbox. So if you download the toolbox, then actually you will get this demo data as well. Um, oh, great. So just to quickly show what's in there. So within the toolbox, we also have some functions that actually shows me what's in the toolbox itself. So sometimes I forget in, uh, what's actually in there and I have to keep track of like, is everything named correctly? So we can actually print the functions on screen that are actually in the toolbox. So this is a list of all the functions that contain in the toolbox. I think currently it's 450 different functions exposed to the front end. And of course, they also come with uh, options. So here I actually can see if everything's named to, uh, correctly. And also sometimes I feel like, what's the name of that function again? And I can go through it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that also that what's important is actually to have uh, good documentation of, of when you write code. So Oh, good. Because I, I was looking at a lot of these functions and thinking, I yeah. bet I could guess what they do, but I yeah. would love to see it in detail. Yeah. So I've, I've been using um, mostly uh, Eclipse with Wolf from uh, Workbench in the past, so now I'm switching more towards uh, Visual Studio Code. Since most of the resource, for, uh, most of the functions that are used to generate documentation are now can be run from Automatica itself, you don't need mm -hmm. the, the Workbench toolbox anymore to generate it. So I have this guide page that starts off with the main toolbox and it shows all the sub toolboxes that are in there. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, tools that are related to this Dixon imaging, water fat imaging. Here, there, you will get the different functions that are in there. You can click through it, and and nowadays, uh, so it's very nice. You can also compile all this to uh, HTML, so everything is available on websites as well. So, I also have an, uh, an online version of this. So, basically, this is all documented, so people can click through all the different things. And uh, I hope, of course, not everything is there. I think there's now eight on it. 50 documentation pages within the toolbox. So the, 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 the data management of that is, is getting a bit um, difficult, but um, luckily uh, the tools are getting better to do this um, also for users and not only for internal uh, development. And then one tool I also use a lot is, is something I've written, it's called memory usage. Actually, when I open this, I get an extra uh, palette that actually says what kind of big data sets are in my memory. Mm -hmm. so like I said, some of the data sets actually get quite big. Um, and if you do computations on them, sometimes your memory will overflow and then everything gets screeched to a halt. So you actually can see what kind of data sets are currently loaded that are above 1 MB, 10 MBs, 100 MBs. And I can also clear them from here. So if I would clear data, I would say clear, and then this is gone. As a related question, so as part of your professional workflow, um, are the sort of, when you're doing these analyses, is it sometimes useful to connect to computers which are sort of faster and more memory than the typical thing that you might have just sitting on a desk or is the scale yeah. of this problem? Okay. So uh, sometimes some point, we do, but I tend to try to make everything as efficient as possible mm -hmm. so that it will run on my own laptop. Mm -hmm. so I can actually do all the computations on my laptop. So it's not a, well, it's a quite a heavy laptop, but not that, that big. So it's nice that, if, so if you design stuff that actually have to run on service and people have to have like, Get Mathematica installed and all those kinds of things. And that's sort of like a higher uh, requirement for the software. So everything actually uh, runs on my laptop, which is just, I think, 32 gigabytes of RAM and an iCore 7. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to try to optimize things that actually they will run uh, on a simple system. So it's definitely it's, great for people who are wanting to sort of explore areas that, you know, maybe they're either looking to get into or just sort of curious about. So that, that's awesome that yeah. uh, everything is, is uh, designed to, yeah, to work. Yeah, and of course, yeah. if you need to go so, so, so to, to bigger systems, it's always a possibility. But uh, mm -hmm. so, um, so what one of these data sets looks like. So this is some loading now a data set of some lags. So <laughs> uh, let me just quickly show. So one of the most important things in data processing, I think, is always looking at data knowing what you have, knowing what you measured. So data visualization is a really important part of data analysis. I mm -hmm. think maybe even the most important one. So uh, of course, Mathematica has a lot of built-in functions like uh, especially been added over the last few years with uh, the default image head, um, but also some other like good plotting functions. And there's a lot of options you can give to it um, to make it look pretty. Um, so I built this graphical user interface built on Manipulate, where you can actually slide through these data sets. I, I should ask immediately because uh, just want to be sure of people using this. All of these medical images are anonymized, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They're, they're all anonymized. So the ones that I share um, uh, are anonymized. Um, so these are two um, uh, lower legs. So you see here the tibia bone. Just show. So this is the tibia bone, so your shin bone basically, and then we have the calf muscles here. Um, so this is a, a, a typical data set um, from the fusion weighted imaging that I look at. And of course, we really want to look so look at data in like other orientations. Um, and you might also notice that the resolution of this data in this specific case is 1.5 by 1.5 by 6 millimeters. So the the, the, the transverse images where you do a sort of a cross-section of the leg has a high in-plane resolution, but if you actually look at the sagittal and coronal, coronal views, then actually the C direction is different than um, the in-plane resolution. So actually these, these pixels here are actually 
in a ratio 1.5 by 6. So that's already one of the things you have to tweak when you display medical images. You have to take into account like real world measures. So mm. I would take away this, this voxel definition. So this is actually the definition here. So that's actually um, just saying, well, it's a sigma 3 by 3 actually in this specific case. And if I would now look at this data on this direction and actually it's it's not correct. It's not anatomically correct anymore. So that's, of course, one of the things I have to take care of. So therefore, we we felt this viewer, and also, of course, when you make nice color colored images, you can do all kinds of crazy things with it. And this is just it, in the background. It just uses array plot um, to quickly do all this. But yeah, um, it's it's convenient to have this to actually uh, look at it. So you can add a legend bar. You can type something in the plot title. So each time, if you you don't have to do the the code generation over and over. And of course, there's also some export stuff, so I can export it. Like multiple files as animated GIFs or any image format. Mm -hmm. that, uh, just out of curiosity, what do the numbers corresponding to the colors? In measure? this case, just arbitrary units because it's just um, a grayscale image. So I can show you quantitative data uh, a little bit later on that actually mm -hmm. shows that these numbers actually have meaning. So this is basically raw data so that we, we get from the scanner. So it's arbitrary scaled. Uh, typically, it comes from DICOM, which is in a medical imaging standard. Mm -hmm. So medical devices export the data as DICOM. Uh, Mathematica has default DICOM uh, import export functionality to also get all, to all the metadata that's in there. Um, so then these values are arbitrarily scaled. Typically it's 12-bit or 16-bit integers. And then once we do computation out of it, so these models can, for example, give um, uh, uh, water fat fractions in percent. So then all of a sudden these numbers do have value. Uh, so then we go from like qualitative data to quantitative data. And mm -hmm. that's, that's um, after we did uh, apply all the models and get really, then these values will actually, and then therefore color bars. So typically I use grayscale if I look at uh, qualitative data and color bars if I uh, look at quantitative data. So right now all it's measuring is brightness of image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, if, and then um, let me see if I can get to a different data set. Uh, do, 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 do. Do this. So if we would do uh, look at this full data set. So this was one volume of this data set. Mm -hmm. And now I'm looking at all volumes. So we actually do multiple directions of this data. Um, direction is the wrong word. So we this is the fusion weighted data, which is actually the sensitivity of the machine is set to uh, the fusion. So basically when we have uh, motion of water molecules, uh, this causes signal attenuation. So we lose signal due to the motion of water. And the amount of signal we lose is actually proportional to the actual underlying diffusion constant. And the diffusion constant basically means the amount of random walk particles will do. So that's really on the molecular scale. And um, when you freeze water, it doesn't move. When you mm -hmm. heat it up, it moves violently. So the diffusion constant goes up with temperature. But also, if if the fusion is just free in free water, if you drop a drop of ink in there, it will diffuse throughout the entire volume. But if you put something in straws, for example, you have these barriers where water cannot pass through, and then we can actually uh, say something about the directionality of the diffusion in the, in the tissue. So there, to actually infer that, um, we need multiple measurements with dif different diffusion weighing strengths, but also different diffusion weighing directions. And with directions, I mean that. If we apply the fusion weighing in, for example, a longer muscle fiber or perpendicular to it, we have different contrasts. So this is the same data, but now you can see that's actually not a 3D data set anymore, but it has slices uh, mm -hmm. in one. So that's still going through the data set, but I have an extra dimension to my data. So this is actually the different measurements we do. And you see that the contrast actually changes throughout the measurements. And this is actually different diffusion weighing strengths in different directions. So let me just zoom in a bit on these high diffusion weight images. So you can still see the, the, uh, the muscle structure, but mm -hmm. you can see the contrast changing with, with different muscles. And actually that, that's the information we use in these models. So we sort of get a 3D representation of what the diffusion is actually doing. So if you would look at what the measurements actually is, um, that's gonna be plot, no, gradient plot, I think. Gradient plot, yes, of the gradient values. So actually, we Ooh. apply the diffusion weighing in these different directions. So it's, it's like evenly distributed in half a sphere. 
and then with different strengths. So the outer shell is the, the biggest diffusion weighing strength, and then we have varying the number of directions um, uh, going inward. And we do this on half a sphere typically because the fusion is symmetric. We can't really infer direction, positive or negative. So we don't need to do the measurements in the negative direction. And actually, from, so if we want to optimize these experiments, actually also build something. It's also really nice to see gradient. Uh, no, it's going to be generate, generate gradient GUI. So this is actually a tool that we build to actually generate or design these experiments. So let's say I'm going to do um, a multi-shell experiment, what we call it, multiple diffusion wave strength. So I can give in the values here and actually we can generate these, oh. these, these things. So this is based on uh, static repulsion of particles on a sphere. And then we have uh, different shells that are all equally spaced in, 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 uh, on half a sphere. And they also don't uh, overlap. So they always have like unique directional information. Of course, you can also tweak this a bit. So they don't really um, optimize a single shell, but everything is optimized, but each single shell is not really optimized. So yes, now it's done. So this is something we typically don't want, or we can go the only way the other direction where each shell on its own is completely optimized, but there's no crosstalk between. So this is all, so this demonstration is basically built for, for, for uh, teaching purposes, but also mm -hmm. to do experimental design. Um, and of course, there's different ways of visualizing this. You can also fold it out on uh, a grid. So actually you fold out the, the sphere. So if you do also with the um, map of the, the world, right? So you have a sphere and then you can map it out in a Cartesian grid. So then you, mentioned, you mentioned two things I'm curious about. One, one is that when you're uh, talking about uh, optimization, uh, what are some different things that uh, uh, you might be looking for that, uh, you know, different strategies would be optimal for? So uh, for example, like different things that you're trying to spot while doing imaging. Yeah, so uh, if we talk about, for example, the fusion imaging specifically, Mm -hmm. um, then um, we can design an experiment that's, that's optimized to do um, quantitative analysis of the diffusion properties. For example, look at what's the mean diffus diffusion inside a tissue. So okay. uh, let's say if a healthy cell has a membrane, if, if you get disease, the membrane falls apart, so the diffusion gets more free. Uh -huh. also okay. an, and there's a tropic aspect to this diffusion signal, so it's not equal in all directions. Like I said, along the muscle fiber, we can have a high diffusion and perpendicular to its low. So uh -huh. we can look at the ratio of the diffusion, so it's called uh, fractional anisotropy. So we have an anisotropic part of the signal, so we can also quantify that, and that's what we call uh, FA then in that case. So we can also imagine that if cells start to uh, get smaller, then there's more restriction perpendicular to it. Then, um, so these kinds of things we typically look at. Um, we also can do... Uh, something called fiber tractography, where we actually can generate a um, 3D representation of the muscle architecture. I'll show you an example uh, later on of that. So looking uh -huh. forward to it. You can you can design these experiments to to be sensitive to different aspects. Okay. Uh, All of this sounds extremely precise. You mentioned um, error um, measurements and and figuring that out. I guess I was wondering what are sources of errors when you've got a machine that can detect the fusion of water yeah. across the cell membrane. Like what, what is yeah, the. So, uh, too many. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, one of the main things, so we typically talk about two kinds of errors. So one is physiological. Mm -hmm. So people move. Regrettably. Sure. Sure. Um, so you have motion. So macroscopic motion, but also pulsation, for example, if your heart pumps blood through cells, through vessels. So there's those pulsate. Um, but also we're dealing with a quite sensitive measurement equipment. So also there's, there's thermal or electronic noise in the measurement. So mm -hmm. you can imagine that if we try to uh, get to too high of a resolution, there's enough signal in each imaging location. So it's the same with like taking a, a picture in a well-lit environment or in a, at night. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So we get thermal noise and physiological noise. So those are the two main uh, things that we look at. And those the origins of the Thermal noise can be uh, loads of things. So we also, before we start doing, applying the model, we have to do a lot of signal processing, uh, pre-processing typically we call. So we try to enhance our data. 
Mm -hmm. I have something here that would be maybe nice to show. Um, let me just see if I load this. So I and will for, for the, the audience data. here. Hmm? Yeah, I was just gonna say for the audience here while you're loading this up, this is showing um, one way that you can take this sort of noise, noisy initial data and then clean it up. Uh, just yeah. is that a fair summary? Yeah. Yeah. So this is so. Um, I thought I had a MX file loaded, but it can't find it. So I'll uh, rerun it. So this is basically an algorithm um, that can actually get rid of noise in data. Ooh. So if we're quite used to this with when we look at, for example, like if you look at the, the old CSI shows, like enhance this this blurry image. Yeah, sure. Or, or you get these with, nowadays. Which is all things. nonsense, usually. When they're... Uh, there is a fundamental, so you, you can do that. So there's now images that can upscale uh, mm -hmm. resolution of pictures without you even seeing oh, the yeah. difference. So when you look at, at technology on your camera that actually takes pictures at night, uh, these images look crisp and they only look 10 years ago, it would be a noisy, noisy thing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when there was a noisy image, there would be pretty much nothing you could do about it. But yeah, so there are techniques actually. And because we, we take, we're not taking the same image over and over, but we take the, the image. So the anatomy stays the same and we, mm -hmm. we have sort of um, uh, changing signal over time. And there needs to mm -hmm. be some structure to it. So in this specific case, I'm actually using something based on principal component uh, analysis to actually decompose the signal and recompose the signal and then hopefully only keep the signal part and get rid of the noise part. So mm -hmm. now this is actually running uh, real time. So uh, for this, I use... Uh, so the nice thing about... But, but for me, using Mathematica is that, um, especially when first trying stuff, you can do really rapid prototyping because almost everything has a Mathematica function nowadays, mm -hmm. which is already there. Um, and typically it does the job, um, but because it can handle so many different variants of the data, it's typically not the most optimized. So the core algorithm will be optimized. So there's a lot of tricks to actually get to this core algorithm in a lot of cases to actually make things quick. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but when you start prototyping, you don't really have to think about that. It's mm -hmm. only when you know what you're doing and then everything works, you actually want to do something fast. So let's see. Cool. So it's good for exploration because you never know what direction you're going to need to go in. Yeah. So a tool and, that and does only yeah. one thing might be missing something you're going to need. Yeah. yeah so when I started um, programming for science, it's, yeah, like I think 2008, 2009, really doing it on a large scale. Mm -hmm. um, Mathematica, I think Mathematica 5 was out back then, and you had MATLAB and Python was around a bit, and then C, um, of course. But then Python was not as advanced as it was now. Also, Mathematica was not. But when I started using it for the first time, it's like, hmm, this can do a lot of things that I don't have to think about. That's what I liked about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it sort of things grew out of hand a bit. And now I'm kind of stuck to it because if I have to recode everything this in a different language, I will be, uh, I need a very long sabbatical to do this. <laughs> Makes sense. So you've you've built something so huge. Yeah. And so and, and, you know. and, and luckily nowadays, it's really easy to 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 link Python to different programming languages. And so with, with also with Jupyter. And vice and versa. Also, different Wolfram language that runs on command line. So I think the integration of different programming languages has become so much better over the years. Mm -hmm. It's actually also not that important what kind of language you're 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 using the only so thing so open science is now really a hot thing so mm -hmm. uh, my code is open source but Mathematica is paid license so that's sort of like hindering some people and say oh python is completely free sure but uh, nowadays it doesn't have to be so when you uh, run the wolfram language kernel you can also run it from Jupyter notebooks you don't need the Mathematica front end and it's still free so i think that that actually is a nice development to get yeah. it more accepted Mm -hmm. and, so actually, uh, the, the example yeah, is now yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead. All right. So I think the example is now done. So this, these two data sets actually look quite similar, but this one yeah. right has denoised, so we can actually scroll through it and let's look at a, a low in signal intensity where the noise is a bit more visible. Um, and so for the audience, the the noisy version is on the left and the denoised yeah. is on the right. Yeah. So let's look at the difference of the two so it's also some overlay things i have here so the difference of these two data sets oh, okay. so there's actually immediately subtracted so we can actually scroll to different volumes and you see that the thing that's removed is actually noise or actually the difference between the two data sets looks like white noise mm -hmm. which is good because that's basically yeah. what it is yeah it should be um if everything goes right 
I see. So, so if you were seeing a structure that looks like muscles or something, you would say, oh. I'm, re I'm removing signal and not noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So as you, you can, so I've built in some other, so there's more hobby project. You can also do some, some fancy checkboard visualizations, for example. It's more of like, it doesn't really have a big use case, but it was fun to, to explore. <laughs> do some overlay where you can just go from left to right. Um, so I've got all these, it actually helps with making, Images for publications. I sometimes you need pretty images for your publication, and it's nice to have something that makes you generate a lot of images really quickly without having to code everything. Mm -hmm. So basically, all these things plug into the options of array plot, and then um, it's automatically propagated. Ooh. So, so one, one thing I'm curious about when you're mentioning doing a principal component analysis is that, like, I, th I don't know when it was first added to the language, but um, uh, now I know that there are sort of high level functions for people who want to do principal component analysis. When you first started building this, was was that added yet? Or is that something that you you implemented using more low level functions at the time? And then let um, me ask for people who might not be familiar, such as me, what <laughs> defines principal component analysis? Well, um, you can represent any vector into sort of, or set of vectors into sort of a, a basis space. You can do, same as dimensional reduction, you actually try to, to project your, your data space onto a lower dimensional representation of that. Uh huh. And um, so typically, so you have the, the typical eigen system decomposition, uh, where you have eigenvalues, eigenvectors, you have mm -hmm. the principal component, independent components, all different ways of actually splitting the signal into its basis vectors and the weights of these vectors. And then you can say, well, these are the main components that actually build the signal, and the other ones actually are so low in amplitude that I can actually remove them and then we make the signal from that. And actually for this, I think I just use the default. Well, we can actually mm. look at it. I have no clue what kind of function I'm actually. So when I do development, I say, well, I use Eclipse. So this is, I know, in denoising tools, and it's called PCA denoising. So I And it's, it's quite hard to read a lot of I these. I don't think I can zoom in. In what's a good question? Can I zoom in here? Uh, window appearance, zoom, show. I have no clue. Let me just open in um, in Mathematica. Yeah, yeah oh, if you're an so. audience member, uh, you know, wondering, you know, sort of what goes into building a, a large tool set like this, you're, you're getting a great uh, sort of view of, of what this looks like and I, we'll, we'll ask some more detailed questions and if you as an audience member have any questions about tips and tricks for you know building a, a large set of integrated tools that complete some high level functionality like doing qmri yeah. um you know do put in questions into the yep. chat we have an interesting question uh from the audience about errors connected to that but i want to uh wrap this up here before we yeah, so touch on that now it should be opening hopefully in so it's but all yeah, absolutely. from yeah, language files, questions. but so for, for like when you use GitHub for code sharing and that's mm -hmm. kind of things, mm -hmm. then actually the, uh, why isn't this opening? Let me do it differently. Just do it the old fashioned way. And uh, be noise tools. There we go. Cool. So this is exactly the same file, but then run it in the in Wolfram language front end, and then it always gives this weird message where I have no clue how to fix it, but it always does it. So we have to go to, so I work quite structured in these kinds of things. So mm -hmm. um, so these things you can see in Mathematica, I don't really see here. Well, you see them being inserted here, but they don't really have value, but for here, it's quite nice. So functions yeah. always have users notes, all structured, and then we go to the correct one. So PCA denoise. And then somewhere here, there should be calling to the principal component in somewhere. This is also, you're, you're seeing live the advantage of having uh, high level functions for things because you know the, you can do this part once and then the high level functions sort of take care of that. Yeah, I want to see, uh, find. All right, now I've, I've optimized this with low-level functions. This is not doing the principal component. Oh, I, cool. I now realize. So it's actually okay. doing I, yeah, I was, I was uh, curious. Yeah, so I'm actually doing so. But yeah, this is sort of how I build up my toolboxes in general. So everything is highly organized. All the functions have usage code. And I try to also be quite structured with adding syntax information to everything. So I can actually have user input. So the user actually gets feedback, like, are, are you using the correct number of arguments? Mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things. So that's sort of the... Um... That's a wonderful thing. I, I love how much that is built into our built-in functions. So I'm so glad yeah. that it's 
uh, a tool that when people are making their own functions, their own tools, they'll be able. Yeah, it's come a long way over the years. I think that, that it's getting more user friendly. A lot of the things I learned the hard way of just trying and seeing some small examples here and mm -hmm. there on the forum and stuff like that. So uh, it has you evolved over the years. I think that the, especially the loading of the toolbox and getting all the context right, because I've, I've now uh, many, many different. Um, so if I zoom in a bit here, so these are all the different things that work together. Mm -hmm. um, and each of these scripts has to be aware of the context of the others to actually work because there will be functions in here that are called here and here and have Makes sense. Left. Makes sense. Hopefully it was, was um, a nice learning curve over the years. Uh, so this is, of course, the, the main loader that actually loads everything. Mm -hmm. But it's actually, it's not just calling uh, uh, get uh, toolbox, but it's also... Uh, removing all uh, context from all the function names that are actually in the toolbox. So it destroys all uh, previous made definitions that might interfere with my toolbox. It oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Reruns everything. It, it, it loads the, the documentation. Uh, it actually has also some uh, feedback if you want to load it to actually see when I'm debugging or things are actually going wrong. I can actually do something that's like this. So I have verbose loading. So you can actually define for both true, and then it will load, giving you a lot of feedback of what's actually happening. Oh, cool. So, so you, then, you mentioned uh, teaching earlier. And so yeah. when, when you're showing uh, this functionality, um, I don't know if you want to uh, bring up that point now, or if you want to uh, save it until after you've shown some more of the functionality that's in, in this toolbox. But the, the angle of teaching is something that I think is really important. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a lot of people who are Considering going into various fields, people who might be interested in medical imaging and uh, saying, "Oh wow, like this this is amazing technology. I want to use this." Um, the the teaching aspects I think are going to be particularly relevant for them. So I just wanted to put a pin in that part of the conversation. That uh, whenever you feel appropriate to sort of talk about you know using tools yeah, like this for the so, of teaching. Um, yeah, I think this will actually when a lot of the Images and concepts I show in presentations while teaching are actually generated by Mathematica. Um, mm -hmm. But I typically tell students, you program in every environment that you like, because once yeah. you know uh, coding in a language, it's quite easy to learn coding in a different language. It's more about um, the logic behind coding than actually using what kind of language. Uh, we like to say grammar, it's easy. Sometimes, yeah. So, um, but in the end, if they do projects with me, um, yeah, they have to use this. Oh yeah, just be <laughs> yeah, for these kinds of like demonstration notebooks. Where actually, you you can highlight or show um, uh, what's going on with coding with simple examples. I think is quite important. So mm -hmm. this notebook is also made specifically for that. So it shows low level functionality, just as documentation does in in, in a Wolfram language, to actually sh show and highlight what's possible. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do something new or special with it, of course, you have to think for yourself. So in that case, I, I use this a lot to show them, like I'm doing with you guys now, to show demonstration of what the capabilities are. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because with education, visualization is also really important. Mm -hmm. So you really need like sometimes to visualize processes. And... Um, I think also that has come a long way in generating movies, animations uh, with Manipulate. It's quite easy to show stuff happening. Um, so, for example, I think one of the things that is very specific to this uh, Dixon technique is, I think, optimize Dixon echo this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite critical to show, but actually here we need to optimize two parameters and it does different things with with the signal oh, and how it goes so this can actually be quite helpful to to show what's going on so these kinds of things i've also built over the years to actually one for one help me optimize my experiments but also to show actually what's going on so you can and then of course these these are the things typically that hobby projects that go out of hand so i build something simple and then because it's fun to build i go crazy with it um yeah so these kinds of things yeah, they help a lot um, in that sense. Um, so yeah, this, this is one of the, the applications I maybe what's nice also show is um, quickly zoom out a bit and have an overview. Mm -hmm. um, so this was mostly, so I'll, I'll show some something else about the fusion uh, later on, but um, some other things that I do a lot is of course, um, 
simulations to actually show the accuracy of the models. So that's also something built into this. Mm -hmm. um, that's fantastic well, as a feature. Yeah, so we, the modeling, because the symbolic nature of, of, of Mathematica, it's quite easy to build forward and inverse models. So basically you write the same code once, or you write code once and then either you port it into uh, find fit or you port it into a uh, 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 table and you generate the signal with it. So that, that's sort of nice. Mm -hmm. I think it's also nice to show. So this is something also quite unique to MR. So MR, oh, wow. I've been showing um, um, magnitude images, as we call them, so grayscale images, but actually the MR signal is a complex number. So we measure uh, complex value data. So the data we get out of it has, has magnitude and phase. Mm -hmm. So the phase also holds information and phase um, it's typically scale between minus pi and, and plus pi, and that actually um, uh, can get wrapped. So if you have a wrong settings, you get these phase wraps. And this is some things that I really like to do is like see what kind of algorithms are out there to do this efficiently. Uh, I, I recently found that there's a research function that does phase unwrapping uh, in a 1D case. So if I would try to unwrap all these phase wraps and this noisy data, using a research function. So this is a research function that does it. And then we can visualize what actually is happening. Um, let's see, yeah. So you can see this is the things I showed before. And there are, um, this is the ground truth that it should look like. And then here you see the results. So in 1D it does it great, but in 2D it's, and 3D even for medical data, it becomes a, a quite more challenging uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing. So there's a lot of, literature out there really fundamental algorithmic things um, to do with these kinds of data sets. And, and for a lot of MR applications, phase unwrapping is quite important. So we built some functions that actually do a better job in this. So actually you can get uh, back to this really nice uh, visualization. And this is something I, I do use in teaching a lot. So when you, the nice thing is that you can just show the images in the notebook. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that, that we use a lot. Um, let me just quickly, I don't know why WhatsApp is not muted. Um, talking about on. what it should be versus what it is, there was a question a little bit ago in the chat of from someone. And of course, I understand this could have a lot of different answers based on very specific circumstances. But it <laughs> said, is, there's, is there a probabilistic chance of identifying false positives? positives in these scans and then a follow-up yeah. question might be sort of what what tools do you use as a professional to sort of uh test for that and to try to not have that happen yeah so i'm i'm doing preclinical research so really showing or developing new techniques that might work in the future and of course when you do clinical translation um false positives and false negatives i think mm. false negatives even worse. So yeah, right. when you're not diagnosed with it. That's that's worse than being like post, uh, positively identified with a disease. Uh, in hindsight, uh, sorry, we were wrong. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a, that's that's a hot topic, but that's more a statistics thing. So we try to understand what's the variability of the measurement we do. Mm -hmm. So what's the predictive value of it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we want to prove, for example, that a patient group. A is different than patient group B. We need to prove that statistically first. So we do large group experiments. So uh, tens, even hundreds of patients to show actually that there's the ability to distinguish people from healthy or diseased. Um, and then um, to actually make it relevant for a single patient, you need sort of cutoff values. So like above this threshold value, if your um, cholesterol is above this value, you're uh, high risk of those kinds of things, but that's more like epidemiology and statistics. So we typically, so my research is mostly focused on developing the machine itself, the code that runs on the machine and the analysis methods that, that come with it. So if we design a new measurement technique, um, we want to sort of give people the indication this might be possible and do some clinical validation, of course, myself as well. Uh, and then hopefully um, the next step is working with uh, doctors in the hospital to actually translate it to uh, patients in the clinic, but that, that takes decades sometimes. That makes sense. So so uh, you can talk about how accurate or how prone to inaccuracy the measurement is, but in terms of whether or not that is especially likely to create a false positive, probably the best measure of that would be 
try yes. and see where you find it or don't and count how many of those were yeah. false. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's so, so I work in an academic hospital, but on the engineering side, and we work in large multidisciplinary teams. So we have mm-hmm. different skill sets. We have mathematicians, physicists, engineers, uh, doctors all working together. So, uh, of course, when we start moving things toward patients or testing things on patients, we need also doctors to work with us. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's very different if you set up a pilot study or something, study to say, say how prove that something really works. That's the, the, the scale of that. So if I test something, I test it on five subjects, maybe 10, to show proof of principle. But if you move to larger studies, so some, some of these uh, bigger studies can include thousands, maybe tens of thousands of patients worldwide. So those mm-hmm. are um, multi-year uh, studies. Um, so I just started a new study myself, and I'm just looking at, at healthy people to actually understand what defines the variability in muscles when we measure them with these mm-hmm. techniques. Is, is it age, gender? Is it uh, the amount of exercise you do, a bodybuilder or a long-distance runner? They're different. You can see it. And we have a, our measurements actually show these differences. So we can see that uh, uh, a neuromuscular patient is different than a healthy one. We don't need these oh. techniques for that. So we, But we do need techniques to evaluate med- medication, for example. So if we want to start giving patients medication, um, is this medication working? It's expensive. Um, you don't want to wait for five years to see if things get worse or not. Sure. You want to see very small changes in the early stage. And therefore, we're developing more of these techniques. So that, that's sort of what I'm doing now. So for example, now I'm, I'm starting a study with 250 subjects. But that before I even finish with data acquisition, I'm two years in. And then mm-hmm. I have to analyze it. So that, that's sort of a slow process. So therefore, uh, yeah, it's, um, but I think it's, it's in most scientific fields, right? So you have breakthrough moments, like oh, everything's working, but then the news picks up on it, but they never say, well, it's 40 years in the making or something like that. So that's, uh, right. <laughs> So I think that's that's sort of uh, there. There was a, that's the nice thing about science, actually, that that it's small incremental steps and in understanding. Yeah, we have another audience question related to statistics. If we want to briefly um, it, go into to that, so uh, the question was, uh, what do you use for doing circular statistics um, in your data analysis? Um, is, is there particular functions that you find useful, or, or um, do you have any tips um, for doing that? So for like generating and simulating data, I use the built-in functions from, from Mathematica. So there's a huge, uh, large number of, of statistical distributions available. For statistical analysis, typically, uh, so there is some NOVA um, uh, toolboxes and some basic mm-hmm. t test stuff going on, but the more advanced stuff, so, there are, so you can build your own linear regression model in Mathematica, uh, but there are software tools better equipped for that. So uh, R mm-hmm. as a programming language has, has purposely been built for statistics and it's yep. also doing R is very good at what it now. does. And you can interface R uh, with Mathematica or vice versa. Um, there's... Uh, dedicated statistical software packages written like SPSS. Um, so when, when you use statistics, you typically have this Excel sheet and you just want to crunch the numbers. And then mathematically for me, it's slightly too cumbersome. I just want to click some function options and do that the thing, do everything. Mm-hmm. So it would be all possible in Mathematica, but so mostly I use R and SPSS for that. Um, but and so as a follow-up question, so you, you like to use lots of different tool sets for doing what you do. Um, so I, I know it's possible that one can uh, run R code from within a uh, Mathematica session. Is this mm-hmm. what you do, or do you typically sort of pr- you know run one thing, have it produce a result, and then feed the result to uh, another language? Or what, what's your flow for that usually? Uh, if really the application. Okay. It really depends. So sometimes um, I use the inline stuff, um, mm-hmm. but mostly. So data analysis and then preparing the data for, for analysis is like sort of an endpoint where you can now have my Excel sheet or now have my I export from Mathematica to whatever format I want. Mm-hmm. And then I start doing the last part of statistical analysis and then for plotting, stuff like that. So I, I, it's typically more convenient to split it up. Um, there mm-hmm. are some tools that I, I, I've i pre-compiled as executables and I run from Mathematica language. And then basically mm-hmm. um, from in Mathematica language, I run on command line certain commands to, to call tools. For example, to do image registration, I think that's also an example here. Um, so when I say image registration, I mean that, that the other sort of noise is, of course, um, um, subject motion. Um, let me just find a uh, good example of that. Um, go up. So um, 
yeah here. So this is something that that um, image registration is basically aligning two images that they match. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's like this function uh, image stitch that can do like these nice spherical things in Mathematica. So that yeah. principle is the same for a lot of medical data. If you want to get rid of motion, um, you, you perform registration. And, and the, the, the functionality in Mathematica is, is, is nice, but it's not uh, good enough for the, prop, uh, the, uh, the applications we use. So for example, if I've so I loaded the same data set again, but now I've uh, taken one leg out of it and this is the original and this one, I, um, I changed the, the orientation of. Mm -hmm. so this would be a large movement and I wanna realign these two volumes. So this Am is I right in understanding this is a vertical orientation? Yeah, so this is sorry, this is the transfer, so the cross-sectional area. If I go through it, you can actually see that I, I scaled, stretched, skewed. I, I really warped the data set to a different orientation. Mm -hmm. This is something that we want to do. So for this example, I call an external um, executable. So there's mm. a huge scientific team that's been optimizing registration algorithms for all kinds of medical purposes. So I would be like, it would be a waste not to use all that knowledge, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's we have a nice ex executable that actually does that. So I call that with this register data function. So let me zoom in again. So I have this regist register data function, and actually that 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 can actually uh, we'll call this executable. Um, it will export some stuff to a temp directory. Then it will run the executable, points to the temp directory, run it there. And once everything's done, I load everything in again. And then hopefully this data set will be now aligned. So um, now you can see this, these two are aligned. So I can see how good the uh, alignment is using, oh, this is the wrong one. I have to use this one. And, um, No, this was which we did. said data, data S. Data um, S. There it is. Yeah. So now these two are hopefully almost aligned. So you see some mm -hmm. and effects on the edges, but they're pretty well aligned. Of course, when the data was cut off, and actually you can we can see how well it did. So we can actually also show. So these were the rotation, translation, scale, and skew parameters. I imposed on the data and this is what I get out of the algorithm. So so here I really use external toolboxes that are highly optimized to do a specific thing, but mm -hmm. they're all being called be in a mathematic environment. So I don't have to switch to a different environment to the registration and they go back, which allows me actually to script quite complicated pipelines without leaving Matica. So hmm. when we do data, so I it's been yeah, evolving over the years. So by now I have this one script that I can run on my data set that I acquire. So I go to the, the scanner, acquire some data, put it on a specific uh, folder in the server. I turn on my notebook as I run scripts and then I wait for a few hours and everything's processed. And that's all done for Mathematica. But then, um, yeah, that, that's really high level of automation. And of course, then you still have to check everything if everything went correctly, you sure. the crash and that, those kinds of things. Because I think especially with, fitting data to every image point. So when I say we do like forward modeling, I do this for each image point in the data set. So when you have like 100 by 100 by 100 data points, that's mm -hmm. to maybe sometimes a million evaluations for one data set. So it's not just fitting one function with find mm -hmm. fit, running that same function 1 million times. So there, um, the chance of you getting numer numerical errors or unexpected things happening is quite high. And especially when you run over hundreds of data sets, <laughs> uh, so, you will always yeah. get this one exception that will crash the entire system and you have no clue why. And then you have to find the specific voxel and where it happens. And then you have this rounding error that happens when you do optimization and then, yeah, everything goes to, <laughs> but that's uh, sort of the, so yeah. That's always about, oh, oh sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, hearing about how much more complicated this has gotten over years because you've been adding features to it, it it, it is great to hear because I love how much the Wolfram language is backwards compatible. That when something works, it should continue working. I, it made me think, though, has have changes to MRI technology made you need to go back and change any of your tools to to fit the new. Uh, yeah, sort of... oh, definitely, definitely. So science is evolving constantly. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I remember when I did my first data set, I was looking at forearm muscles 
And mm-hmm. um, the acquisition time of that data set was around 20 million, uh, 20 minutes. Um, and now I do the same data acquisition in three minutes. So the scanner has become so, better. Yeah. So we have like new acceleration techniques on the scanner itself. We don't have to acquire the full data set. We can have like, we can acquire sort of compressed versions of the data and then uncompress it uh, later on to get the full images again. So on that side, a lot of things have changed. So we can mm-hmm. get more data in the same amount of time if you want to turn it around. So if you still have the same amount of time, you can actually get more data, but also the models we use to process and analyze the data. So mm-hmm. for example, this, the, the noise removal, I think that I'm now at the sixth iteration of that technique. So I've used different versions over the years. So I still have the old functions that did the, the things I did in the past. But yeah, if you see somebody publishing a new article with like a new method, um, you need, yeah, either find how to implement it to find their code and use that or implement it yourself. So that, yeah, that's constantly evolving. But so for my toolbox, I never guarantee backward compatibility because I think mm-hmm. from, a, from a business point of view, it's very smart to do it. But from a research point of view, it's too much of a hassle. The same with like error catching and stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. I can spend a lot of time doing that. Um, but just, yeah, that's not my my main aim. Your goal it. is that it works now to show, with the techniques yeah. and the te- technology that you have. And the moment it goes to clinic or to applications or to to vendors to imply to 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 to, to incorporate in their MRI machines, mm-hmm. they're not going to use mathematical code for that. That's going to be highly optimized code written in in C or whatever. So um, yeah, so the, that translation step for me is not that important. Um, gotcha. I just, the moment a new new version of mathematical comes out, I typically run this entire demonstration notebook to see if the main functionality is maintained, mm-hmm. which. Um, Sometimes is, sometimes isn't. Um, everybody makes mistakes. Sometimes it's my mistake. Sometimes uh, some things are uh, thought to be uh, backward compatible or not. Um, but yeah, then, then typically it's solved in a new version if you just make a nice post in the forum, for example, and like, hey, something unexpected is happening. Is it me misunderstanding the new functionality or is it you guys messing something up? They're typically quite honest in, in saying, ah, oh, we might have missed something, which is quite logical. And then... Mm-hmm. Most of the times, actually, finish quite quite quickly. Makes sense. Okay. Makes sense. So, I mean, I I know that we can compile our code so that it runs in a similar C style, efficient sort of way where the computer yeah. is figuring out what is doing what. But it it makes sense. It's it's a good thing that people who are working in other coding languages will have a use for everything you're discovering here, even if they don't speak the language you're using. Yeah, and, I think that's and and nowadays like coding. Like when you know how to do something, it's easy, mm-hmm. right? It's always in sure. hindsight, everything's easy. So once you know the yeah. algorithm, then it's mm-hmm. easy to optimize it, mm-hmm. right? So code optimization and, and writing optimal algorithms is a complete field of science on its own. So mm-hmm. I don't really want to touch that. So I really <laughs> like it that there's like highly optimized versions of, of most of the, 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 the functions in Mathematica and also don't, don't have to like download certain packages to actually added information to uh, mm-hmm. most of the time. Yeah. So, of course, some people have written amazing packages that do stuff that, that Mathematica doesn't have. And now with the function repository and the packet repository, uh, these things get more visible mm-hmm. because in the past it would be uh, sort of uh, non, non-findable. non It's like you have, you, have, you have like nice Python repositories online and stuff like that and where people can share their code. And now there's this Infrastructure coming that also Mathematica users have this platform to share stuff, which is mm-hmm. actually quite nice. And you can actually see that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening there. So yeah, that's 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 um, I think good for development. Um, and then I, I did test some of my notebooks from like ten years ago, and they still and they still run um, most of the time. That's good. Cool. So- I have a variety of questions, but I also want to um, be conscious of uh, your time and make yeah. sure that you get yeah. a chance to show off any other functionality that you think is, um, you know, really, you're really excited for people to know about that that's there. Um, and so yeah. I'll, I'll. Uh, no, I can go away with a question. I have some okay. more things on the show, but. Um... Uh, so w- one of the questions that that uh, I have actually is that when you're, uh, you know, creating functionality like this that has a lot of graphic user interfaces. So do you generally speaking, uh, what what's your design process there? Like, do, do you have a, 
particular interface in mind from the beginning that you're like, oh, this would be really nice if uh, I could code this up. And so the, the picture of the finished process is sort of existing in your mind first, or is this something that you you build over iterations when you're prototyping things or, or how to, maybe a little bit of both? Uh, how does that usually go for you? Mostly iterations. So typically <clears> I'm starting with like, I want to plot a certain function. So I type in the function and I make a plot out of it. And it's like, mm, what's the dependency of this parameter? And I put a small manipulate around it. And then just one slider for this, this one parameter to get some more intuitive feeling about it. Mm -hmm. Then um, it gets out of hand. <laughs> 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 then, then uh, becomes in a general, I try project. to not write uh, too much graphical user interfaces uh, uh -huh. because they're quite hard work to make work. So sure. properly, so the simple cases are quite easy. So with with with, with the simple manipulate and a few things. Mm -hmm. So the one I showed with the so the this one. So this is the GUI version of this. This is basically just saying I want twelve. Just go. Mm. This is how I use it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all that fancy visualization is nice for demonstration purposes, um, but it becomes slow. Um, so yeah, and it's, it's it's actually quite a lot of work. And I, I actually try to make this GUI work, for example, in cloud, but it's like you need so many dependent functions and visualization mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. and it's all... Mm. Eh. So I, I, I do like building them because it's like it's it's nice to have something visual and tangible, but mm -hmm. most of the main core things don't have uh, GUIs in there because it's it's a skill on its own. And also, think when when think when people can press buttons, right? They start to press all the buttons. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. So like, yes. The 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 order in which you press buttons becomes important, and you have to do error catching, and then yeah, so you, yeah, you have to be the the, the, the monk test right. If you push everything in simultaneously, Mathematica should not crash. Um, yeah. So cool. yeah, I I like building them, um, but for true function, it's it's more demonstration and visualization purposes than than really daily use. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can script and code it, I will script and code it, and if I press a button, uh, life is too short to press buttons. I typically right. say. Exactly. Um, so I wanted it, to ask. Oh, oh, sorry, John. Did you have a follow up there? Yeah, it was going to be about the the larger scale designing pipelines. So, um, it, no, if you had a question that's about this topic, maybe we could do this one and then talk about um, the sort of designing the pipelines that you were talking about before. My question is on another topic. So, okay. So yeah, my so my follow up question then is that so you know the the, the visualization is nice for teaching for sort of understanding yeah. what's going on, but as you say, life's too short to do this when you're when you're dealing with huge huge data sets. So uh, what would your tips and tricks be for uh, designing a pipeline like you're talking about, where you you, know, you have this data? Um, nowadays, it can be compressed, but originally it wasn't even when it was coming off yeah. the the uh, device, if I was hearing correctly. And then you want to do these analysis steps, and then you want to have sort of a, an analyzed product that is being sent off to someone that then they can use to make professional decisions about. So how do you, what, what tips would you have? How do you think about that process? Um, what do you use to do that when you're thinking about designing these pipelines yeah so it's it's the first step where a lot of people in my opinion do wrong is this they start they have not really a clear picture in their head and you start coding and then it becomes this like beast of code that nobody really understands the logic anymore they don't have so a you, plan you have to have a plan a really thought out plan and then cut it up in small pieces so mm -hmm. which are the steps i have to go from a to b and then make so like what I'm showing here, so when I have this, for example, with the fusion data, import, denoise, register, um, then do model fitting. So the tensor fitting that, that we use here. So that's actually one of the steps here is fitting the tensor itself, then doing quantitative analysis of the tensor, and then maybe even do uh, muscle segmentation and analysis. So all these steps are like chunks and together mm -hmm. they form this big beast of a script that cannot do everything, but Let's say I just wanted to have a slightly different denoising method. I can just swap out that one function and mm -hmm. then really have a clear picture in your mind which steps you have to go through. And if it feels becomes too big or too chunky, then cut it up in smaller projects that you can actually also easier debug. So you can test these things in isolation. Um, so this is the computational thinking that we were kind of talking about earlier. And so when, when you're thinking about something like this, if I'm hearing you, you think about it at a high level and then as you were saying before, you worry about some of the optimization details of is it as fast as it can possibly be for, you know, doing this you know, 10 trillion times uh, in yeah, a later so date, right? That's a different question. 
Yeah, so typically when I have like a new function that I want to try out, I just build it, make it work. Mm -hmm. and then, um, sometimes it's useful and I keep using it and then it starts to crash once in a while. Like, why is this in a specific exception going to crash? And then I'll solve the issue. Yeah. And I'm using it over and over and all of a sudden I use it in every pipeline. It's like, mm, now I'm waiting two minutes for this computation each time. I have to do it a few hundred times. Now it might be an interesting point to say, well, can I make it twice as fast? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I, I'll save hours. But but if I spend hours making something 10% faster, it's not worth the time because computers do things on their own perfectly fine and I'll just wait over the weekend. But if I have to like, let's say I want to process these 100 data sets I just acquired and it takes four hours per data set. I'm looking at days. Mm -hmm. And then if I can make something twice as fast, it's only a day. So mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it becomes useful to actually do code optimization a bit. Mm -hmm. So that typically my code goes up to a lot of iterations. So something useful, am I going to use it a lot? Some of these codes are written five, 10 years ago. Once in a while I need it, there's no reason to optimize it. So this, this large scale, um, I don't think you can start something like with, so you have to have the end vision, Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but everything's built piece by piece. So if you want to try to do everything at once, it, it will never work. You have to make it manageable, small chunks. Where's the gain you can get um, instead of trying to do it? So you, you can easily get stuck in optimizing a function for days because it's fun to get this puzzle working. And then you've lost a week of, of work and then you gain 10% of speed. And it's like, mm, was it really worth it? So sometimes you have to also be, be sort of realistic in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we had another audience comment about, um, you know, being interested to learn more about this tool for uh, MRI analysis. And uh, yes, we will have uh, links to the presentation notebooks uh, available uh, after yeah. the stream is live oh, yes. on the, the replay. You'll definitely, excuse me, definitely be able to see that. Um, and so uh, I want to, I wanted to take the uh, opportunity when we had that comment, uh, what are the sorts of things uh, that come up a lot in QMRI are functionality that's within uh, this tool set that you've built? Um, so basically all these applications are basically loading data, processing data, and generating pictures. Mm -hmm. and that's, one of so that, that, that's the main pipeline. So most of the functionality is, is all related to one of these steps. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, there's a lot of like things, uh, basic things that I need. So most of it's like designed around that, but there's some like basic functionality that's added to the language that's are really needed to these large scale things that are actually not in the language. So let me see if I can find some explanations about that. So very simple operations. Um, so yeah, for example here, let's generate some data. So the... Uh, so very simple things like operations without ignoring zeros. That sounds quite, quite trivial. So mathematics can handle complex infinity, infinity, and everything else. Mm -hmm. But the moment you're working with numeric arrays, they're typically packed arrays in the Wolfram language, and you can do really fast numerical computation on that. If one of these values, one million pixels you have in your data set becomes mm -hmm. an integer or a complex infinity, uh, a lot of these functions become mm -hmm. much slower. Sure, right, because so, you're you're using exact rather than machine precision at that point. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so so a lot of these functionalities that I've added, for example, is like mean and median without with ignoring zeros, uh, taking the exponent and a, and a log of, of things that actually don't generate. Uh, so this so for me, uh, log of, so this would not be allowed. So just mm -hmm. give zero. Back. So zero mm -hmm. is a background voxel doesn't contain information. I don't care about those locations. If this happens. I can put infinity, complex infinity, but a zero for me is just, just as fine. So these are quite simple things that I can actually do. Um, what's another thing that I use a lot is, um, yeah, so this is something I use a lot. So um, when you have a vector, you have a mathematical function, rotate left, rotate right. So you have a vector, rotate right three times. So this is sort of um, rotating dimensions of data. Mm. So this dimension is 25 by 160 by 160. And I said, rotate dimensions left. It actually does the, so this is a transpose. Um, so it would be transpose three, one, two. Mm -hmm. That's the same as rotating the dimensions, but everything about like, okay, which transpose do I need now? I can just say, well, rotate dimensions left three times, for example, if two times and I get back three times, I would get back to the original dimension again, reverse dimension. So it's X, Y, Z becomes uh, C, Y, X. 
So these mm-hmm. kinds of very simple, basic data operations I've also put into this. So that, yeah, that's very handy, independent of QMRI work. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this for another example is, for example, when you have singleton dimensions, mm. yeah, you want to get rid of them. So I think MATLAB has this nice function squeeze. So I made squeeze for for, mm-hmm. for Mathematica. Mm-hmm. Um, vectorizing stuff. So Mathematica is really good in like not caring about dimensionality and you say map over whatever dimension. But in many specific cases, vectorizing your data is much more um, computational beneficial. Mm-hmm. You only have to loop over one dimension, you have to track, you keep track of, of, of what's what. Uh, also, for example, we have a lot of background voxels. You don't want to loop over it and do the check. Uh, do I need this? You say, well, get me all the data that's in this. So the, the, this data set, put it into a vector. And then you have like a one dimensional vector actually where you can just always loop over the first dimension. And then uh, you have to vector the original dimensions and the coordinates that belong to it. And you can make uh, back the original data set. Ooh. So this sure. makes it really simple, for example, to do um, logical operators. Like if a value is first value zero, then delete the coordinates and only process the coordinates that are a valid, a valid thing. So and these these kinds of like higher level things are very specific to working with numeric arrays, which actually in Mathematica is not, uh, it can do it, but it's not designed to do it, right? So there's a lot of languages actually to ha- designed to handle large numerical arrays and Mathematica, you have to really force Mathematica to think numerical. Mm-hmm. Mm. But default says, well, no, I want to do symbolic. No, 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 you're going to do things, everything has to run numerical now. So there's a lot of things that I use in my functions to actually not allow any symbolic values in these arrays. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Always, so I think most of my functions start with um, make numerical, two packed array, uh, Remove symbolic values. If Very cool. Yeah. Or like it's not, it's not numeric Q uh, stop. Like how you're not giving me numeric array. Right, I'm right. Yeah. Don't yeah, want this the, is one of the first comparing speed tips apples that we, and oranges here. Yeah, this is one of the, definitely one of the first speed tips that we we always want people to know is that if you think something is going slower than it should, um, make sure that you're actually working numerically rather than with with exact values yeah, because so that, that I, will be a big difference. Yeah, here you see it. So the signal goes in. It's mm-hmm. like. Numeric signal. And first step is, is, yep. Because, yeah, of course, it's easy to make an integer or something like that. So you can test it, for example, if you have a big array, you just generate a big array with random numbers, uh, do a transpose round, and then uh, add, change the first value to an integer and see what happens. So that's actually, uh, well, cool. even with these low level computations, the moment something symbolic happens in this array, it, it handles it just as fine. But if you really want speed, um, and in general, you don't notice it. Like for, for these, most of the, the things you do, you do once. But when you start looping over huge data sets over millions of voxels, then the difference between a millisecond or 10 milliseconds makes a huge difference because it's a factor mm-hmm. 10. So when you fit a function and this function fit takes a uh, one millisecond, I'm happy. But if it takes uh, 10 milliseconds, I'm not happy because that's mm-hmm. the difference between a day and one and a half weeks. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a factor 10. So that's it sort of then, then, then this really, so then speed optimization. So I use compile a lot. So not the, the new C compiler framework, but the old fashioned compile as a list. So I have this function here. Very powerful it's function. Yeah. Compile, compilable, compile, you know, what's it called? Compile. Uh, is it possibly a compiled function? I, I saw it in the list of ones that you uh, displayed at the very beginning. Um, the, the exact name is... There it is. Yeah, there we are. Yep. So, it's one. so this is all the functions that, that, that can be called by the compile function that actually will actually speed up. <laughs> so you can put everything you want in compile, but if it's not in this list, it doesn't really make sense to put it into compile. Mm-hmm. This in is my experience. especially well for so these, 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 I think this, I, I found this code online somewhere. You can actually, it's changed per version, but this actually runs something that actually gets everything that's in this compile list. So like random real or log or stuff like that, that can actually be sped up a lot by putting it into comp- compile. Mm-hmm. And compile can make list make can be made listable on any dimension. So that's nice. So the normal listable function in Mathematica native is only going to the last dimension always. So mm-hmm. you, you do it on numerical values. And these actually can actually all put, be put into compile. So this typically I take a look at like, am, am I using this function heavily that's in this list? So then I can put it into compile function and make that, that, that cool. core 
part quicker. Um, um, I, I know we've got about 15 minutes left before yeah. a pretty hard out for you. So um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned some 3D functionality, yeah. and I was wondering, you think of MRIs especially as looking inside of things. So I wondered what sort of 3D results yeah. do you get that that are not just the surface level, but actually... Yeah. Yeah, so it would be the, the, the nice closure for this, I think. So I'm talking about model fitting. So this diffusion, diffusion signal, we, we fit a, a, a two-dimensional tensor. So mm -hmm. right, two tensor to this signal. So that's basically an ellipsoid in 3D space. And this ellipsoid actually aligns with the underlying uh, tissue properties. Mm -hmm. This ellipsoid, the signal can actually be um, quantitatively described. So you can actually look at the... Um, so, for example, when we do this, uh, so we can actually look at how spherical is it, how elongated is it, so you can get these quantitative parameter maps. And I'm going to switch to something more quantitative. So now we're actually looking at quantitative values. So where, where zero is not having this value. So here we go from linear to planar to spherical. So this tensor shape within muscle is mostly spherical, but does have a planar component and mostly mm -hmm. a linear component to it. Ooh. So this linear component is actually the most interesting one because if this ellipsoid aligns with uh, the tissue, I think I have on the more from the form. So let me just do things simultaneously here. Meanwhile, I'm going to run something here. Um, Fiber tractography. Yeah, that's, that's that what sounds we interesting. That mean. So I think I have something better explaining it. Here, so I made a post on it a while ago on the. So this actually explains more. So this is in this case for brain. So this is mm -hmm. a human brain. What we see here now is not not the muscle anymore. So for each location, oh we can get this like nice candy shape. So these are the tensors I was talking about. And then the main direction of this tensor actually is sort of a, a small line. And then you, you basically, basically play connected dots. So you, have a, you get a vector field and you perform um, interpolation or integration of this vector field. And from integration vector fields, you get streamlines. Oh, so my goodness. Path, I think it's the streamline plot. So here we're actually visualizing the main white matter pathways in the human brain with this technique. So I have also something that, that's doing that in muscle. So what does white mean. matter mean? I, I Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so our brain is composed of different structures. So we have this, right. if you look at the outside, sort of this folded blobby space. Mm -hmm. And outside with the cortex, which is called gray matter. Right. That's basically where all the processing happens. And then the, there, there's um, um, pathways running from one location running to the other. So that's actually white matter. That's the, 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 the wiring of our brain. And it really runs in the core of our brain. So that's actually has um, uh, neurons connecting one part of the brain to the oh other. Oh, my goodness. And that's, and that's also what we're highly, seeing here. Highly anisotropic. And therefore, we can actually visualize these, these, these neuro, neurological pathways and actually say, well, this part of the brain is connected to this part of the brain, for example. Oh, my goodness. It's, and then these colors actually have meaning because blue goes up, down, red goes left, right, and green goes uh, back, back and forth. So it's the same thing we can do for, for muscle. Um, so let me just show the same data set again. I have to do this and this. So now actually we have this tensor, this vector field derived from tensors uh, for this lower leg. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to apply the fiber cryptography. So this is one of these functions that did optimize a lot. Um, so now it's going, seeding 50,000 random voxels in this data set. And from each of these locations, it will do this following the vector field. So it does this, this interpolation of this vector field, but then uh, 50,000 times. And it also checks if it needs to continue. So for example, if the curvature becomes too high, it stops. If Are it we still tracking continue, neurons here or is it no, So now we're doing else? muscle fibers. So I'm doing the lower leg muscle fibers in this specific case. Right. I remembered you saying with the lower leg, but I was wondering, are we tracking yeah. neurons? So there's, the there's, 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 there's nerves in there as well, of course, because the signal from the brain goes through the spinal cord. Um, to your muscles. So your muscles are innervated by nerves. So there's also nerves running in, in your muscle tissue. So uh, we did some experiments on that as well. So you can actually visualize peripheral nerves um, as well. So now it is actually, so here I do care about time. So it's a, well, this took 
53 seconds. Um, I started 50,000, 24,000 of them were valid. This is the average length I generate with it. So this is sort of something that, that actually gets it. Mm -hmm. And then this has been, um, let me see, then we have to go to, I'm gonna filter it a bit. And then we're gonna select some specific tracks. So then if I look at the tracks, so I'm gonna plot 5,000 of these 24,000 valid mm -hmm. ones. So these are all lines in 3D. So here again, oh dimensionality and, 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 and size actually matters. Because and what is the color the function uh, showing in, in this uh, particular example? So it's the same as in the brain. So blue is up down and mm -hmm. all our muscle fibers actually run up down the leg. Most of them, because they have to contract. For example, you tilt your foot like this. These muscle fibers have to contract. So you have to pull this way, and therefore they all run in this direction. Mm -hmm. So this is again a small part of the calf. You can see the, the the hole here where the bones are. The muscle fibers attached to the bone, and then internal structures of each muscle is different. So here we can clearly see, for example, that we have what we call a bipennet muscle. So that's an internal. This is actually the Achilles tendon running in the middle here. So it's soleus. Let me see, change this to. Method tube. This was a, a struggle to get working in quite okay speeds because the pre computation this takes a while and the rendering is actually quite good now, but also the hopefully it won't crash. Probably should have lowered the 5000 a bit since we're also fast. It, it's, it's good to live dangerously. <laughs> yeah, so we're living on the edge, but we're also getting to, yeah, there we go. Oh, my goodness. Because everything's computed. So now instead of using the, the line uh, hat, I'm using the uh, tube hat for graphics 3D. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the same computation, the same visualization. So once it's generated, it's actually quite fast. But generating all these objects is actually quite computationally intensive. Mm -hmm. So once the front end has like this, so if you convert this to uh, input form, you have this long list of, graphics directives and primitives and stuff like that. And the front end has to render it. But once it's there, you can actually see more of depth to it. And of course, then we can also start filtering the tracks. So let's say we, we only want to look at specific muscles and also change the color coding, not from this directionality. So for example, like red is left, right, blue is up, down. We can also just color code them, for example, for length. So now I'm looking length, track coloring, 20 to 120 millimeters. So everything lives in world coordinates. like. Anatomically correct, one millimeter represents really one millimeter in the real world. So that's mm -hmm. part of, so this is now one specific part of the muscle uh, extracted of the two legs, where you can see the internal structure, but also now it's color coded that we have some longer fibers here, some shorter fibers in the center. So this is sort of where we. So of course the getting so you would get macroscopic architecture of the muscle. And this generates pretty pictures, which is quite nice for covers of journals and, and, and pictures and uh, images in, in publications. Of course, we also have to do quantitative analysis a bit. So we want to have mm -hmm. something like what's the distribution of length? What's the angle of these vectors compared to the bone, for example? So now, so we're now up to this stage. And from here, we're going to do, again, quantitative analysis on the things we derive from this. So it's layering functionality on functionality on functionality on functionality. And the nice thing is that, that once all these things are thoroughly tested, you can just hook them all together. So one of these process scripts will actually be me just calling import, process, uh, fit, uh, and analyze, do tractography, extract muscles, those steps. And then it's a script. And then you have something automated. Mm -hmm. But of course, each of these functions individually take um, takes quite a while. And, and so if there is someone who's curious about um, what, uh, that workflow looks like? Where, where would you uh, direct them? Is there a different community post for that? Or is there uh, maybe a, a paper that you've written or, or some particular place that, uh, that would sort of be a multiple, good place to multiple see Multiple papers that? over the years, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so it's like uh, science is a continuation, right? So you get new insights. Sure. So I improve on my methods. So I write new papers. So I have to do it better. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that one of the nice things, so I... Uh, this in this so this is a muscle bits tool so that's another notebook and here actually is this automation so actually have functions that say well process and that's really a high level function that you say this is the data have fun with it mm -hmm. so here you would have muscle bits process for example this one so this is a huge script that actually says well if you have this type of data and you say process with the method Dixon 
then call um, some logging tools that actually will automate logs, import some information, do masking, go through face correction, add functions to do fitting, Dixon reconstruction. So this is basically all these functions I just mentioned string together into one concise framework and then you mm -hmm. can switch to a different processing. So this is actually, so this, 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 this collection of functions is actually really high level things that, that, that you only touch when you're like, we really want to do something from A to Z, so mm -hmm. to say. And of course you have to just go to, so I have my, I, the toolbox itself has a website where I explain a lot of these things. So this is of course. And I'm uh, hearing you say that it didn't start off this complicated. No, 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 no. I, I think 10 years ago, I've never seen this happening, becoming so big. I started with five functions and then it became 10 and then it became 20. Just whatever improves it, whatever. And, and helps. then before you knew it, you had a pipeline. Yeah, and now it's 450. And the, 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 so at some point, I think I went, went to like 80 functions. Then I started doing documentation because I actually started like losing track of. Sure. Um, what I'm actually at the program five years ago. So this is therefore this 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 documentation. So this is actually documentation via the, the browser. So then I started actually adding documentation to it. I wish I started sooner because then going through 80 functions, figuring out what it did and commenting everything. But now I'm quite 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 concise in that. So when I write a function and I'm added to the toolbox, then I comment the code. So what does the snippet of code do? And then I read the documentation for it. And then all these pages are automatically generated from the usage message that you get from the uh, the documentation. So basically, function as a usage message. That usage message generates a documentation page that you mm -hmm. can add to the guide pages. And then most of it is automated. Luckily, mm -hmm. there, there's an old story about a, a king who loved roosters, wanted to hire an artist to draw just an amazing poster of the a picture of the rooster and the artist said okay it'll take me some time the king said no problem absolutely how long is it going to take I, I don't know i don't know and so the artist goes off starts doing his work king periodically sends someone to say hey is it done the artist keeps saying i need more time another month another whatever the king's patient for a while but eventually just brings his whole army to the door of the artist just kicks down the door and says i want my picture now the artist says i got it hang on and in five minutes makes the best picture of a rooster the king's ever seen now the king's happy but also mad because it, it it's been so long that took you five minutes what's going on he says hang on and the artist takes him to a back room wall to ceiling pictures of roosters every surface just stacks yeah. and stacks of pictures of roosters he says it took me years to be able to draw the perfect rooster <laughs> in five minutes yeah that, yeah, like, it's, that it's, and just looking at this tool, it definitely reminds me of that, that it, yeah. it seems like something that's going to be simple. It's actually very complicated under the hood, but in operation, it's incredibly efficient. Yeah. It's incredibly versatile. That's that's just really yes, the skills take time to learn. And once you master them, it looks easy. And yeah. Never have to. Uh, yeah. I'm still learning every day uh, using Mathematica. I still find new functions that I didn't know exist. Sometimes on the community forum, I read a post like, does this function exist? Ooh, that actually solves a problem I, I was doing like a different way. And uh, mm -hmm. so never never stop learning and reading, I think, in that sense, mm -hmm. because once you're happy with what you can do, you can always improve on it. And, and I think the same with science. If you stop being innovative or innovative, then science screeches to a halt. And I think that's the, the, the goal of science to advance the knowledge. So you can only advance the knowledge by knowing what has been known up to then to add to it. So, and that takes years and then, yeah, you never stop learning. Definitely yeah. true. I, I can't think of a better parting thought than that. I'll ask if you have any other ones, but I know that your your time that you have available with us today is, is nearing its end. So uh, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. I know our audience has found this really valuable and oh, will yes. definitely enjoy looking into this tool set. Um, so are there any other things that you'd just like to make sure that people are aware of out there? Um, no, yeah, so you, you can find everything I just showed on my GitHub page. So that's my, maybe nice to show us and schooling GitHub and there you can actually download everything here. So the, the, all the data that I showed are just here in the resources, but better is just to go to the, to the release file, um, here. 
Why can't Great. you just download the packlet? Just do will the instructions software. to do this be in the notebook that you're uploading? Yeah. That will upload? Great. Yeah. That's great. So the, inst the installation instructions are in the readme or on the website. And then the packlet should install all the demo data, all the functionality. And you should be able just to open the demo notebook, run the first line, and it should all work if the packlet installed correctly. So that's sort of the... Yeah, my last question. So I really enjoyed uh, talking to you guys. Uh, really we really enjoyed having you. We talk about this work in a slightly different context than I do normally. So um, really happy I could uh, could could have um, added to, uh, to to your nice uh, series of uh, things and things to come. Well, yeah, and so I, I I know I have a lot of follow up questions about um, you know people who are interested in getting into this area, um, backgrounds and training, all this kind of stuff. But we've only just scratched the surface of QMRI tools and the the sort of interesting intellectual history that brings us to the point where we can have tools like this and and you can download them and uh, try them out yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Yep. And th thank you, definitely. And like you said, for things to come, we look forward to any further interaction we can have with you because this has been fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Hope to see you all at the, at the user forum. That's uh, where I spend a lot of my time as well. So very good. OK. Nice talking to you all. Nice talking to you. And thank you all, everyone who has watched, all the viewers. Thank you very much. We will see you next time.